This is a great song. I'm totally <laughs> down with the music this week. Hi, everybody. I'm Morgan Hutchinson. This is the eighth episode of Designing on the Front Lines. Welcome back. This is a show that brings together healthcare providers, designers, and others to talk about how we can improve our world. Um, and I'm Morgan Hutchinson. Hey, everybody, and I'm Matt Fields, and we are two emergency medicine doctors who also work in the health design lab at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, and we are joined by our team and co-sponsors from the health design lab, Bon Ku, Rob Puglese, Christy Shine, Mary Ellen Daly, and all of our students who are joining us. Hey, guys, good to have you here. And from Cooper Hewitt, we have Ellen Lupton and Pam Horn. Hi, everybody. Today is June 26th, and while many of us are over the COVID pandemic, the COVID pandemic is not over. This was evidenced this week largely by the fact that many states, including Texas and Florida, increased their, shut down their reopening efforts because of rising number of cases. In fact, last week I had reported that half of the states had increasing cases. This week, 30 states have increasing number of cases. Yeah, but one piece of good news is there has not been a spike in COVID cases related to protests, likely in part due to making use of outdoor spaces, but also due to wearing masks. So it's super important to have our masks on. This is really cool to see and we can, that we can make interventions that allow for public gatherings and also really kind of changes the conversation from becoming not how do we prevent COVID from getting here because it's here, but how do we redesign our lives to maintain social needs, but also prevent COVID spread. Thank you all for joining us again or for the first time. It's great to see you guys with us today. We've got a great group of speakers. Remember everybody, keep your video on throughout the hour. Use the chat box to introduce yourself, talk to one another and ask any questions for the speakers. We will have time at the end to address those questions. And if you missed any of our prior episodes, you can check them out at healthdesignlab.com slash D-O-T-F-L. That's right, and this week I am so excited that we have three tremendous speakers. We have Sheila Ruder, Emma Greer, and Dennis Boyle. We will also have one themed six minute breakout room where everybody will be broken up into random groups of about five people where you'll get to introduce yourself and uh, meet other people. We'll give a prompt to kind of stimulate some interesting conversation and hopefully everybody will make a new friend. First, we have a couple exciting updates for you. I would like to introduce our Producer Rob Polisi. Thanks, guys. I just wanted to let you know today's music. I played a little Anderson Pack. That was a pretty sweet song from his Malibu album called The Season. That recommendation came from a good friend of mine who I just saw this week for the first time since the pandemic, Glenn Ottinger, who is an ER pharmacist here at Jefferson. For those who don't know, pharmacists are everywhere, including in emergency departments, making sure that your drug therapy is safe. So be kind to your pharmacist throughout there, making sure that you're you're all good. So thank you. Back to you. That's an excellent update and 100% agree with that. You guys are lifesavers. Um, next, I would like to give you guys the first ever design find of the week with Colleen Clark. Um, Colleen, so, are you here? So I think I just got a message from Colleen that she didn't have the oh. link. So we might have to, well, we might have to come back to Colleen. Ooh, we'll have to uh, come back to the design find of the week. I know you guys are all on will. the edge of your seat we'll save, that we'll one. Save that, we'll save that cool find for later. Um, and so if, uh, if it's okay, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into our first speaker then. Um, let's do speaker. it. Let's do it, yeah, let's jump into it. So our first speaker today is Sheila Ruder. She is an architect and principal at H HKS Architecture. Sheila is committed to designing healthcare environments that focus on patient safety and operational efficiency and is a member of the FGI Health Guidelines Revision Committee. Very cool. During the COVID pandemic, Sheila and her colleagues at HKS created a document on ER contagion, which pulled from lessons from across the nation, interviewed ED knowledge experts and clinicians to derive key takeaways for how we can prepare for the next wave and make longer term changes to the way EDs are designed. As somebody who works in the emergency department, I have been super excited to hear this. And so Sheila, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry that I can't share my video. My Zoom doesn't like it and it shuts me down. So um, otherwise you'd see me. But I'm gonna go ahead and um, share with you some of our findings. This document, as, um, as he was saying, was created through interviews with health systems across the United States. And we basically broke down all of the feedback and ideas that we received into eight primary categories. And 
although this is focused on the emergency room, and that was our, our vision as we, as we did those interviews, it can be used across the entire hospital. And with slight adaptations, you can even use all of these eight categories in any building type. So kind of keep that in mind as we walk through it. Um, this is our task force that we put together. And this is a, an, an assortment of subject matter experts with um, planners, researchers, and engineers. And these were the eight primary categories that we came across. I'm gonna walk through them quickly and just hit some highlights because I don't have a lot of time and I definitely wanna hear the other speakers. But one of the primary categories was a portal at the entryway, wherever you're receiving patients that may or may not be infected, creating some sort of portal, uh, it could be demountable partitions or a tent, uh, would provide a protected position for staff to be able to uh, greet people and be um, doing an initial quick lip triage and provide PPE and screening. So that would be a temporary condition. And then if you look to long-term construction in a new facility, um, that could be built in and be um, supplemented with increased security protocols. You could add uh, built-in storage for PPE and other supplies, as well as uh, hand-washing stations. The second category is the PPE itself, and the main thing is to keep the separation of donning and doffing areas. And the way we can do that and make sure that the clean PPE doesn't get contaminated is by color coding and signage and making it very obvious donning areas versus doffing areas. And also providing collection points and disinfection for reusable PPE. In the long-term scenario, uh, the disposal stations for PPE can be built in, and we can provide a, a sink in that location as well. Another thing that uh, came up a lot was hands-free doors. So if we can provide uh, foot poles or even an OR paddle for the doors on these locations, then we can help uh, to avoid the reinfection. Across facility um, planning for pathogen resistance. So this is high risk and high touch surfaces um, at providing an adhesive film that's highly cleanable or color coding these areas so that EVS and housekeeping will know that this needs to be cleaned more often and um, at, at, to, a bit, to a higher degree. Long-term identifying um, seamless, um, solutions for finishes, minimizing reveals and cracks, um, and even the idea of the ability to control equipment from outside of the patient room. So this is showing a, a window. You could reach in and control the equipment and minimize the uh, um, exposure to staff. Of course, we're all increasing um, air changes and HIPAA filtration. And there's also the opportunity to cre create temporary anti-rooms for negative pressure to uh, uh, support a, a greater number of anti-rooms throughout the facility and negative pressure rooms. Long-term, there are several things that we can consider. And I think one of the biggest ones is the air purification strategies that are available within the ventilation system. So when that air comes through the HVAC system, purifying that air before it um, gets recirculated. Compartmentalization strategies. This is utilizing existing compartments where you've got fire doors or smoke doors to be able to separate and cohort um, infected patients versus non-infected patients. And you can also add temporary walls and doors to uh, supplement existing. In the long term, we can think about this a little bit more thoroughly and plan ahead to provide pressure gradients relative to risk for each area. And this means uh, the highest positive pressure zone would be where the immunocompromised patients are. And then the highest negative pressure zone would be where the infectious patients are and then a, a gradient along the way. Safe zones and hot zones, I think we're all utilizing this, but the, the key item I want to hit here is the communication of where those zones are. 
So if you've got a hot zone, you can color code that um, to and put signage so that it's very, very clear so that there is no um, in cross infection. And then also identifying cool zones or safe zones where staff can take a moment, feel free to rest a minute, remove their PPE and recharge before they go back in. One of the best ways to accomplish these things in the long term and new construction is to do the on stage off stage, which completely separates the patient traffic from the staff core work zone. Virtual care has definitely been expanding quickly ever since this all took off and a lot of the regulations have been removed to make this happen. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we provide privacy. You can use just a small phone booth so that the provider can have some privacy uh, and, and provide the, uh, the care that's necessary to keep the patient from having to come into the facility. And then as we look at this into the long-term future, adding more um, gusto to those spaces to have dedicated rooms that are fully equipped, that are optimized for coloration of the patient, speech clarity and visibility to make sure that you're getting all of the appropriate information and making a correct diagnosis. And then so the surge capacity, we've seen a lot of this with the alternative care sites, could be tents, um, could be the inflatable units or temporary prefab. And uh, what we really wanna talk about is making sure that those areas have access to any hospital resources, med gases, um, water and things like that. And then as we move into the future in a new construction scenario, providing things like a dock for temporary structures or enclosable canopies over the walk-in entrance or the ambulance entrance that will allow you to quickly just expand your space outside of the existing hospital footprint. All of these things are available um, in our full document, which we can get to you to distribute. Thank you. That 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 is that is great. I love that step by step numerical description. And um, one of the things I, I really love about the way you've kind of designed this is it it or the way you've laid this out is it. it I think it gives good insight to you know, kind of ideal scenarios, but also how to leverage your existing space. And I guess my, um, one of my questions is, uh, one, you know, I love that you jumped right into the, the solutions or the kind of step-by-step. -step. I'd be kind of interested to know a little bit about the methodology for how you kind of arrived to some of the conclu conclusions. And then my other question would be, how do you recommend uh, for emergency departments to uh, take these recommendations and implement and should we, you know, should we be working side by side with architects to implement this on a local level um, to kind of fit our, our existing built environments? Oh my gosh, I love all of your questions. Okay, thank you. First of all, um, the uh, the contributors. You can see a long list of contributors contributors here, and the variety of specialties on the task force. So we did pull subject matter experts um, and, and best practice, as well as the interviews of what people are actually doing and how they'd like to do it better later in the future. Um, and then as far as how to implement this, it's, it's across the board. This is essentially built to be a kit of parts where in an emergency situation, you can take something from each of these categories and implement it immediately. And then there's something else in the categories that you can implement one or two weeks down the road with a little bit of planning. And then other pieces that you can bring in an architect and a full team and build for permanent for the long-term future. So it really was designed to be completely flexible to accommodate um, on any timeline. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. And I love that and I love giving I love that it gives us that direction to um, kind of numerical order in terms of looking at what you have and how to prioritize interventions because you know it's it's it's, it's hard to just implement this all at once and so it, it, I love that guidance. So thank you very much. I think what we're going to do is um, and it's funny I'm looking at your contributors. I didn't know some of these people. So um, <laughs> yeah, uh, they're all good sources. So that's uh, good. 
that, that gives credibility. So I think um, uh, what I'm, we're going to do is we're going to take more questions at the end after, after all the speakers have, have, have had a chance. And so now I'm going to throw it back to Morgan. Guys, we have been joined by Colleen Clark. I know you've all been waiting for. Thank you so much, Sheila, for just joining us and for giving that presentation. I was so excited when um, you guys shared with us those, um, those recommendations. It's so great to know that people are doing that kind of work and making our emergency departments better. And it's great to have you on the show. And Colleen, I will hand it over to you. All right. Hi, everybody. Apologies. Um, security on this show is excellent. Um, happy Friday. So I'm going to share my screen real quick uh, to share something with you that uh, inspired me. Architects are always inspiring me. Um, so this week, I'm sure some of you saw this, but there was this great New York Times Magazine article titled How Architecture Can Help Us Adapt to the Pandemic, and we just heard some really incredible um, examples. So I'm not an architect. I'm just a huge fan and admire of the work and especially how uh, people like Sheila, how their brains work and how they process the world and move through it. So um, this article uh, touches on how work engaging individuals with autism and the design of physical spaces can inspire the process of adapting space in different ways in response to COVID. So it mentions this um, index called Autism Aspects Index and it was created by Magda Mustafa who's a uh, Cairo-based architect, and she came up with these seven criteria listed here over a decade of research, and it's used as a, both an assessment and a design development tool. So one thing that came out of some of this work was this example of a break, breakout pod off of high traffic areas for those with autism who become overstimulated, and then there was this realization that they also happen to create spaces with different air circulation and with fewer individuals, both of which are appropriate and clearly could help mitigate the spread of COVID. So this is just one example of how um, a certain group of people that face difficulties in the built environment can help figure out creative solutions to the spatial challenges that we're facing due to COVID. And that often these groups are, that are discriminated traditionally by the built environment um, can offer and suggest improvements to pervasive design flaws that maybe the rest of us haven't even thought of yet. So I wanted to just kind of leave you with this quote, which I thought was great, um, by Joel Sanders, who's an architect interviewed in this piece. And I'll, I'll link the article to, to the chat um, in a bit. Uh, he says, we sleepwalk our way through the world. Unless a building interior is strikingly different or lavish or unusual, we are unaware of it. COVID is forcing all of us to be aware of how the design of the built environment dictates how we experience the world and each other. And I just thought that was a great summary um, of where we're at. So turn it back over to you, Morgan. Thank you so much, Colleen. That was totally worth the wait. That was awesome. And it was also a great segue with the breakout pod to the breakout pod that we have for you today, also known as our breakout room. This is gonna be the one and only breakout room, so get excited. We have a six minute breakout room. We will randomly assign you all into groups of four to six, could be with anyone. Introduce yourself to everybody else in the room. Tell everyone who you are, where you're from, what you do, what brought you to the show. And we have two prompts for you today. You can take your pick. What is the pandemic habit that you will keep? And what made you laugh this week? All right, here we go. That was a lovely breakout room. Thank you guys so much for joining and sharing with us. We, I met our first person from Australia, which is, you know, awesome how many people from all around the world are calling in and joining us today. Thank you. Um, I would like to hand it over to one of the co-sponsors of our show, Ellen Lupton, who is the co-author of Health Design Thinking and who is a curator um, and author from Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Museum to introduce our next speaker. Man, this Got is a bad yeah. track record today of <laughs> like uh, starting to introduce people. Yeah, so hi, I'm really excited to introduce Emma Greer who's an architect working with Carlo Ratti Associati, or CRA, a design firm with offices in Italy, the US, and the UK. And she's calling in from Milano today. Um, their firm work, it works on applied research, creative design methodologies, and big picture concepts, with a lot of emphasis on high-tech digital technologies 
to create an architecture that senses and responds. Um, and I think Emma's gonna talk about Cura, which is a really interesting uh, temporary hospital design. So uh, welcome, Emma. Thanks, Ellen, and thanks everyone for, for joining us. I'll just share my screen. So as Ellen, Ellen mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm calling in from Milan, so buona sera to everyone. And I wanted to share a, a project that we've been working on at our de design and innovation practice called Cura. So in our quote unquote normal day-to-day -day jobs, we were a group of architects and engineers uh, working on design projects uh, at different scales all over the world. But three, four months ago, we, we shifted gears to try to respond to the COVID pandemic and see how we could help. As many of you probably know, Italy was very hard hit and we lost a lot of work and uh, we had many family members and friends that had fallen ill uh, and we were in a bit of a chaotic moment. So we felt uh, compelled to try and do our, our part. Um, so I, I'm gonna talk about uh, but the project itself, but I, I really want to put the emphasis on how this has changed the way that we work as a practice and that we work with our with our colleagues and also our competitors. And of course, there's the obvious change that many of us aren't working in the office anymore. We're working remotely and connecting via Zoom or GoToMeeting or Skype. Uh, but it's also changed the way we, we work together creatively. Uh, so we've seen a lot more sharing. I mean, I, I loved the guidelines that Sheila has just shared with us. And I wish we had had those three months ago when we started this project because they're super useful. Uh, and I think this kind of sharing belongs to a larger uh, trend we're seeing, which is really like an open source movement. So we've seen all of these different projects that have popped up. Uh, great ideas from designers, scientists, uh, healthcare workers that are being shared in an open source way, uh, both academic partners, but also uh, private companies. Medtronics is one of the biggest producers of ventilators in the US and they, they put up their design specifications for anyone to use online. So a bit in this same vein, uh, at the beginning of March, we came together with a, an international ta task force to try to respond to the need to increase uh, intensive care capacity worldwide. Here's a, a quick list of some of the people, and this list is growing on a daily basis, who, who came together totally in a nonprofit, pro bono, open source way to help us uh, tackle this issue. And, and we met via Skype and go to meeting on a day-to-day -day basis, working evenings and, and nights and weekends to try to get a solution designed and built as soon as we could. Um, and what we, what we developed uh, was a modular ICU in a shipping container. And why we, we chose a shipping container is we, we really started by looking at what were the other options that we were seeing popping up in, in Italy, but also China before Italy and around the world. One being the 10th hospital solution or the converted convention center. And we said, well, that's great and it's fast and those spaces are, are available, uh, but they're also uh, not ideal from a contagion point of view because you can't contain the infection to one area, it's everywhere, and doctors and medical professionals were, 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 were getting ill uh, more quickly. Um, and the other option, of course, was to build a new hospital. In China, we saw amazing stories of new hospitals being built in just a matter of days, but of course, that's very expensive, uh, time-consuming, and uh, also not too easy to move. In Italy, we saw very quickly how patient zero in North Italy uh, started a flare up there, but then the contagion moved to other parts of Italy and we couldn't easily move that spare capacity in the way that we could with a, a, a tent hospital 
or in this case, a shipping container. So we tried to take the best of both worlds. We wanted to develop something that was rapid to deploy, easy to scale up, and could respond in an agile way and move around in a shipping container. Uh, here's the, the basic layout of that shipping container. So we imagine it, uh, we, we built it so that it could host up to two COVID-19 patients who require invasive, inventive, uh, invasive ventilation. Uh, and what you see here in the top right is we've compacted a mechanical unit uh, in the container. So it comes already equipped with all of the uh, mechanical electric equipment required to create negative pressure. So this idea of containing the, the virus through negative pressure that Sheila mentioned earlier is already built into the unit. And these units can work on their own as isolated, uh, as isolated ICUs, or they can work together with others to create an entire ward. So here you see some interior shots. Uh, we've added some, some windows so that medical professionals can also check on neighboring patients without necessarily moving into that container. These units come with all of the exterior and interior finishes, mechanical equipment, and medical equipment required to treat two COVID-19 patients. Here you see a, a one example of how we could configure multiple units together as an annex to hospital ward. So this is, a, Sheila also mentioned the importance of, uh, of having spare capacity or the ability to spill out or add capacity to existing hospitals. We could imagine a scenario where this becomes the COVID ward. Uh, but the hospital can share medical staff um, as well as maintenance staff and some equipment like medical gas supply and, and vacuum. So it could, it could be as an annex to a hospital or it could be an independent field hospital on its own. Uh, so this is a particularly interesting solution for remote areas. Uh, for instance, there's been a lot of interest in Canada for, um, for northern communities that don't have access to hospitals that have the, the right equipment to treat COVID-19. So we can imagine these clusters with their own backup generators, medical gas supply, uh, and accessory functions in addition to the ICUs. Here's another larger unit. So we can really scale up from anywhere, one unit, two units, uh, to 40, 50 units, uh, and beyond. So, in about four weeks, we were here. Uh, that was with the help of all of the different partners around the world, architects, engineers, mechanical and electric designers, um, also field hospital operators, medical professionals. And then four weeks later, we had, a, we had one unit up and running. So we really wanted to quickly move from design to prototyping and to validate some of the assumptions that we made uh, at, at the beginning of the process. So here you see the very first Cura pod, uh, which we built here in Turin, uh, out of a shipping container. Here we've added also an inflatable sort of antechamber, and it has been installed in a uh, makeshift hospital in Turin, Italy, uh, the, that um, and will be the only unit in that makeshift hospital capable of treating um, COVID patients who require invasive ventilation. So the rest of it is more of just an oxygen therapy uh, ward. And this is sort of the most severe patients get moved into our, our core pod. Here you see it in the context of the, actually this is a very beautiful space that's normally used for raves, uh, but it's being put to, to, to better use in these last few months. Um, but what's been really interesting through this process is is we've been able to do a post-occupancy survey and get feedback from maintenance staff, from patients, from medical professionals, and also from our, our own manufacturer who built the first unit. So we're already reiterating the design to respond to some of that feedback. The other really interesting result from all of this uh, was what happens when you take an open, open source approach. So from the very beginning, even the in-progress drawings before we had built the first unit, 
we post we posted them online so at www.quirapause.org there's an open source file section where you can download the as-built drawings uh, some business cases that look at how this compares to other uh, other field hospital models and there's 3d models and and drawings and we shared it with our community also with the help of the world economic forum who was hugely helpful in getting the word out there and what we saw very quickly is that Kurapods started to pop up all over the world here you see examples of Kurapods built in dubai uh, elsewhere in italy uh, there's also a, a group in in canada not far from toronto who used to build uh, medical marijuana facilities in shipping containers and they transformed their assembly line to make cura pods and we you know we we weren't in touch with these people helping them to do this they did this all on their own and they've since shared feedback on the manufacturing process on uh, how this how our design uh, reflects or doesn't reflect the regulations in their in their region and how it would need to be adapted so we've really seen it take off and and take on a whole other other scale all over the world so here's the more examples of of core pods have been built all around the world so just to close i think one of the most interesting takeaways has been just that this this principle of open source design that it's better in this context to share first as sheila had done with her guidelines and as we had done with our website corpods.org to to share your ideas and not patent them or protect them as you might do in another a more commercial setting and that competition is good and not bad so we've seen quote unquote competitors pop up all over the world building cura pods with our design but they've approved improved upon it and allowed us to scale up globally something that we couldn't have done on our own and i also wanted to add a, a call to action uh, for those on the call uh, we we are seeing that this solution is greatly needed especially in the global south so we invite you to share it uh, with your contacts um, and to help us communicate with ministries of health uh, and civil protection forces all over the world to to share this option with them uh, and make it part of their emergency response portfolio and we also want to to get these built and ready for the second wave now i, I put together these slides uh, a couple days ago uh, or last week and and perhaps uh, i was too optimistic because unfortunately we are seeing a second wave in, in parts of the US. So it came sooner than we had expected, but we're ready to go. Uh, and we've actually been talking with a couple companies in the US who found a way to fund Cura Pods through the CARES Act in the US. So there's also uh, funding available uh, to, to build these units in the US and, and to operate them there. So I'd, I'd love to I'd love to hear your your feedback on the design and any questions you might have in the in the Q and A session at the end. But thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to share this project with you. Thank you so much, Emma, for joining us. We have been a big fan of your work. We've been trying to get you guys on the show since the beginning. You guys were one of the first people we talked about, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Not only are you super busy, but I think it's just about midnight where you are. So thank you so much for coming today. I am going to turn it over to our director, Dr. Banku, to introduce our last speaker today. All right, hi, I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce my friend, uh, Dennis Boyle. He is a partner and founding member of the Global design firm IDEO. Tomorrow will be his 40th year at IDEO. And if you don't know Dennis Boyle, there's a law named after him, Den Boyle's Law. That's how I first found out about Dennis. It's, it's, it's a never go to a meeting without a prototype. And this principle of prototyping rapidly has been so influential to me. Dennis has worked on everything from the 
uh, first prototype of the mouse for the Apple Macintosh. She worked with Steve Jobs on that, and he and his partners helped coin the term design thinking even. So he is a legend and we are thrilled to have him here. So thanks, Dennis, uh, Dennis for joining us from California. I'll hand it over to you. Did we lose Dennis? Is he, is he here? I don't see him. Okay, there we go. There you go, cool. Very good, I, I got kicked out and then I'm back. So <laughs> the wonders. Well, th thanks very much, Vaughn uh, and all. It's great to be on the panel with some architects. My father's an architect, so I grew up in that old environment. And also the, this host by the Cooper Hewitt is great because my, one of my great long-term colleagues was Bill Moggridge, who was the director of the Cooper Hewitt about 10 years ago. So it's great to be here. Let's just start the screen here. Okay, host disabled attendee screen sharing. So you gotta let me share we here. We will work on it. <laughs> Let's make Dennis a co-host. Yes. Okay. Well. okay, there we go. Uh, get it, this going here. Let's do that. Does that look, everybody see that? We good? All right. So um, I've been, for the last few months, collecting stories of how designers are resp uh, responding to COVID-19. So it's, it's an honor to be here. I'm just going to, this is a kind of like a highlights reel. Um, so let's, let's just kind of, all right, let's go here. So we were all friends at Stanford. We met, we, now we're 800 people, um, nine places around the U.S., Europe, um, design thinking. Yeah, as Bond said, is, a, is, a, is our business in one form or another, always starting with what people need, what's desirable, and then having business or what's viable and, or, what, or technical um, solutions and what's feasible add on. Um, so there's a, a giant outpouring of effort by designers. It's very inspiring and it's amazing. Every, every day I see new stories. So iterating on old products and services, creating new products and services, creating new infrastructures, creating conditions that promote collaboration, innovation. I, I look at this as an Apollo 13 moment where you're trying to get things that don't normally work together to work together. And this is a, 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 a great time to be a designer in, in health and medicine, in my opinion. Um, one thing I'd love to point out uh, is this great group started by uh, Amanda Salmon and uh, Nick Dawson in, in San Francisco. Amanda is a trauma surgeon at UCSF and this emergency design collective. It's recently become a, uh, a nonprofit. It now has 550 members. I, I, I invite all of you to uh, uh, join a uh, big volunteer workforce. They've got two dozen projects going along and every day, most are COVID related, but now they're starting to be outside of COVID related. Um, let's try to make my, I gotta get my, my, there we go. So uh, 24 different projects at least. Uh, it's time to make your own face mask at the beginning of this because there aren't enough masks to go around. Lots and lots of things published in this early area. So masks could be saved for healthcare workers. Um, lots of good line, online kinds of resources and, and patterns. And then this whole blood donation by uh, Abby Don and her team, the whole blood donation process is kind of broken. There's a great deal of fear, a great deal of uncertainty, a great deal of unknowns. And so they've worked very hard for the last two months to create a whole new blood donor journey. And they're rolling out in 10 different cities around the U.S. for pilot testing to help make this this process, which well has been successful, but now with all these new conditions, is is having a lot of trouble. Um, they're they're carefully uh, collecting and showing ways for people to under to use uh, uh, PPE and keep COVID out of uh, the home, um, shining a light on best practices by healthcare workers. They're they're pointing out um, organizations that are. Uh, looking for PPE or having uh, PPE and distributing among the have and have nots. There's a number of different great organizations that um, have come up in this category and even lots of grassroots as I saw this on a, on a storefront just the other day in San Francisco. People with service and with materials to collect it for people that need it. 
this is a one of a, uh, one of the designers at IDEO had a physician spouse and she had one face mask and they were sharing it among uh, among physicians so they went into the design team went into action created a, a face mask design went and built a couple hundred of them they're so popular they went and did a GoFundMe, raised a hundred thousand dollars and built um, uh, 25,000 of these uh, and, to, and to created a, a, a great thing for especially um, California physicians. You can see some of the work here. Uh, the IDO office in Cambridge went online and did a, a very nice design for at home, at home mask production with details and patterns. And then there's this whole, I just love the, this, Area called MacGyver Care. Everyone's trying to do little hacks, little workarounds. Here's a here's a physician that's showing how uh, that it's easier to wear your PPE all day long with a, a gel bandage. Uh, here's here's a nurse that put the button on on a bandana so you could not you could save your ears. Here's a, a student who created a mask that you could see the lips for people who have hard of hearing so they could lip read. Here's a great friend of both Bond and my Andrea Downing. She's the head of a big breast breast cancer survivor um, uh, group, but she she and their team made uh, PPE out of bras. Here, um, here's a physician who pioneered a, a, a habit of putting a, his face and and his name so people could at least see who what who he looked like and what, that he was smiling. Um, Here's a clever idea on how to get your coffee um, with a foot app or uh, Here's a, a company that's um, innovating around um, making the intubation process safer with a, a shield. Um, here's a physician in Florida that uh, took the material that's normally used in uh, surgical wrap and made um, mass out of that so that they could be sterilized in mass. Um, here's a, a group that formed this RVs for MDs um, so that people that had RVs could loan them to um, healthcare workers that wanted to uh, quarantine themselves from uh, their families. Um, here's a, uh, something being developed at MIT um, where a healthcare worker's mask is, is uh, taken after a shift and analyzed and, uh, and there can be a COVID test. And, and, and so this looks like a promising, another avenue for COVID testing. The whole area of telehealth, we're working in this multiple areas. Here's a woman from WHO that's made a big directory of telehealth sources. The, the funding has doubled and doubled and doubled again uh, in this area. Um, here's, uh, here's even a, uh, Planned Parenthood um, pivoting to have telehealth um, available. Here's um, the health care providers can now use FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, video chat, Google Hangouts, Skype. It's all become possible and regulations are loosening up just because they have to. So um, there's Zoom and Teledoc and Doxy.me. Um, Here's people trying to assemble resources and track the trackers. Susanna Fox, another friend of Bonds of mine, and Startup Health start, launched a whole COVID-19 navigator to help organizations find healthcare solutions. Here's, I've been tracking these, uh, I have 10 of these sites I look at practically every day. They're at the local level, they're at the county level, they're at the state level, they're at the national level and they're at the international level with the one the granddaddy of them all being the Johns Hopkins um, site looking at COVID cases and and recovery um, and then on to the right is how many different diagnostics are being worked on how many treatments are being worked on how many vaccine vaccines are being worked on from another source I, I've been lucky enough to give be a part of uh, uh, three or four different um, online uh, hackathons. Um, last month, 900 nurses I helped uh, with a talk like this um, get together over a 24-hour period and, and innovate with problems in the COVID space. And the month before that was 4,600 4, orthopedic um, specialists and surgeons and, and, uh, and, and, and um, professionals and how the orthopedic uh, uh, community was going to respond to COVID. And this is a 
put on by UCSF. Um, open IDEO, 3,000 people working on how might we rapidly inform and empower communities around the world to stay safe and healthy. Um, and there, here's our very own Ban Ku working with one of these Ambu bags, these manual um, uh, devices. And this is a the, this is where Emma made, I've got the same example as Emma's. There's a great deal of pouring of design of making these bags automatically um, be uh, compressed. And again, here's the MIT one that Emma showed. And uh, it, there's lots of innovation around using snorkels and helmets of sorts to, to the step before intubation so you can have oxygen rich uh, environments. Um, and then companies really started stepping up um, the, here's Abbott with a, with a test, a, a short duration COVID test. Here's scripts using um, wearable data to track COVID. Here's a, a, a company that makes a smart ring, Aura, that is now seeing patterns that you can see three or four days in advance uh, of, of coronavirus infections. And now the NBA has 3,000 of these rings to try to see if they can get in front of this. Um, Adidas making masks, um, Richard Branson making ventilators, um, Medtronic is another one that Emma showed up, put, open sourcing one of their designs. Here's um, Dyson making ventilators, um, here's General Motors making ventilators, there's uh, um, the racing Formula One team for Mercedes making uh, CPAP machines, and, and uh, Ford really went all out, setting up assembly lines for PPE gowns, for face shields, for masks and ventilators, and really put a lot of muscle and time and energy behind this. So I'll end with a little bit of inspiration. The, we, our, our, these physicians, Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci and Dr. Gupta and Dr. Wen, have all become household words and famous, and be, they're working hard to try to help people understand Here's a couple of physicians in New York City who made their big wedding into a, just a few people and then their honeymoon into going back into the uh, clinics to work. So here's uh, every, over this three month period, the, the appreciation for healthcare workers has grown and it's been inspiring and just really awesome to see. And uh, uh, some little points of inspiration, here's a, bunch of families got together so that all their children could go to the prom virtually. And, um, and my son just graduated from medical school a month ago, all virtually. So uh, here, here it worked out as well as it could. He's a Navy physician now in San Diego and uh, doing his residency at that big Naval hospital there. And then this has been pointed out, but I, I, we have oh, some sort of a Zoom, uh, some sort of a Zoom of um, cocktail or Zoom uh, social practically every night with all sorts of different friends and family and, and online art contests. And, and then I'll end with this, the Rotterdam Symphony Orchestra and uh, Toronto Orchestra and a number of others have done all online um, orchestras for, for um, beautiful experiences. Just awesome to see. If you haven't seen it, look them up. So in conclusion, we all have this privilege and responsibility of designing for health. In this day and age, we have to redesign healthcare, but not only with COVID in mind, that's, but also with diversity, inclusion, and racial equality in mind. So best way to predict the future is to invent it and seize the day. So thanks very much, uh, uh, Health Design Lab and uh, Bon for uh, hosting me today. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. That was an incredible list of all of the innovative projects that are going on during this time. And you actually mentioned a few projects that we have um, had represented on the show, a few of our prior speakers. So if you guys right. want to check those out, we got episode three, episode five. Absolutely, it's a great week. Um, we are out of time for questions. I apologize to everybody with their questions, but I think it was totally worth it to hear you guys have a little extra time to talk about your projects. And we were so excited to hear about them. Um, so we have a, next week we are going to take the week off. We've got a holiday week for the show, Designing on the Front Lines. But when we come back on July 10th, we have an excellent panel lined up. We have uh, Michael Murphy, Dr. Rhea Boyd, and Sunny Williams. And that's our show for today. Thank you guys all for coming.
Yeah, everybody have a great weekend. Sorry we ran out of time. Such a great discussion <laughs> as always. Flew by. Yeah. Totally worth it. We'll see you guys in two weeks.